uh, take this opportunity. As uh, tomorrow morning I'll be leaving uh, Wat Ban and Acha. <clears throat> and so there's uh, many opportunities during this time to discuss Dhamma and meditation practice and so forth. It's uh, important to have occasions and because we, you know, in this life you do need a kind of continuous encouragement uh, because it is a, a life of renunciation and you're living at a time where renunciation is is uh, it's not the kind of taste of the week, flavor of the year kind of thing. It's, <clears throat> it's about you know, everything is so affluent and so available on the material world. And then uh, you come here you know, quite young and live within the restraint of this traditional form, renunciate form. But that word renunciation is very important because uh, sometimes our minds are very much conditioned to think of attaining and achieving, like you you want to get samadhi or get become a stream enterer, or uh, it's easy to to use these words of attainment, achievement, uh, as a, a way of reflecting on monastic life. But it's more important to reflect that it's, a, it's about renunciation, about letting go, not about getting. So I found it's very important for myself, the attitude of relinquishing, letting go, uh, is uh, more the appropriate uh, description of this lifestyle. Because actually, you know, people ask me, you've been a monk for so many years, what have you attained? What have you achieved? You know, like, I've been a monk, there will be 47 losses this year. It's a long time, older than most of you. And uh, what I should have gotten something out of it after all this time. <laughs> And what have, what have I got? Am I enlightened? Am I a arahant? Or have you, you know, what, what have you achieved in this life? And so then this, this, it, this doesn't make sense to me because even though I understand where it's coming from, it's not about attaining or achieving. It's about relinquishing, letting go. So it's, uh, you know, like if you really look at the, you know, the description of an arahant, it's a human being who's let go of everything, no attachment, hasn't attained anything. And of course, with a worldly mind, that doesn't, that sounds rather uh, negative, you know, like uh, you want to make an arahant into somebody who's, who's got the most, the highest, the bi- the greatest, uh, highest happiness. He's attained, achieved nibbana. He's, he's the best. And that's the worldly mind operating. You know, if you think of nibbana as the best, it's not the best. The best is about conditioned phenomena. You can have good, better, best, bad, worse, worse in terms of conditions, mental states, views, opinions, material objects, sight, sounds, smells, tastes, touch, and all the rest of it. Then you can compare. This is the best. This is the highest. That's the lowest, the meanest. But in this reflective style, it's not about the best or the worst. It's about letting go, non-attachment to sankhara, to conditions, to phenomena. So this word, sankhara, Pali word, <clears throat> it's it translated sometimes in different different words, but 
it may like phenomena yeah, or uh, conditions uh, you know any anything that it's a thing it's a it's an object it has a beginning and end it has a form a shape it, it isn't permanent you know it it's present and it has a history it begins and ends born is born and dies so the aim, the, the, what the Buddha was pointing at was not to the highest, but to the ordinary, which is Nibbana. Nibbana is not the highest, it's the ordinary. It's the normal. And just, this is for reflection, you know, contemplate these words. Like in, in your own value system, what's ordinary and normal is pretty boring, isn't it? You'd like to be the best have the best, be the best monk and and uh, attain the highest. That's the worldly mind. The ego feeds on that, on becoming, attaining, achieving. So say the arahant doesn't have an ego anymore, so he hasn't attained anything. He just let go of everything. Now letting go of everything... When I say that, how does that affect you, you know, emotionally? If, if you spend 47 years letting go, what is it, you know? Uh, you haven't got anywhere. You've, you've let go of things, but what is that about? And you can't, you can't conceive it. You can't conceive Nibbana or what's normal and ordinary. You can conceive what is extraordinary, what is abnormal, what is, uh, what considered normality generally in the common mind is just fitting into a crazy society without making waves. So you're kind of normal bloke, you know, you, you don't cause a lot of problems. So you're a normal guy. <clears throat> but in this way, like normal, if you're not, if you have no personality, no, no, you're not anything, you know, you're not a, you, you have no identity. The ego is, uh, you know, finds that threatening because, you know, you'd like to, you know, you, to feel that after 47 years you've, you've become something really, you know, special, better than what other people have never even ordained. I'm pointing this out, how language itself is that, is that, is a delusion, like uh, any language, whether it's Thai or English, German or whatever, it's, it's based on uh, defining and evaluating sankaras. You know, this is better than that. This is mine. You know, we identity with our nationality. We're identified with our appearance, with uh, being male or female, identified with our color of our skin, our ethnic background, our social position. We've been trained in, you know, in our own cultures to say this is right and this is wrong and this is good this is bad. And so language itself is, is, uh, is for, to, to denote sankharas, this is pretty, this is ugly. <clears throat> but, uh, nibbana is not about pretty or ugly, or about true or false. It's, it's the norm, you know, so it's like you, you recognize by letting go of conditioned phenomena, and, you know, like, say, an arhat, let go of everything is still conscious human being. You know, they're not. They don't disappear, dissolve into thin air, and they don't uh, go into a zombie state or die. And, uh, you know, they don't collapse in a heap of unconscious, you know, corpse. So what is it that's left? Say, if, if somebody... if if a person has let go of everything, 
Now, in this you have to find out for yourself, you know, what is left if, you're, if there's non-attachment to any, to any sankhara. And that's intuitive awareness. That means it's mindfulness. Sati sampachanya, sati panya. It's real. It's not, it's not like a, an attained state. You don't attain it. Because it's not about uh, controlling phenomena so it, it becomes refined. It's about opening, recognizing, informing with wisdom, and recognizing, realizing Dhamma or rea- ultimate reality. So then you, you begin to notice that the world we live in is a delusion. Like all, all our things that we regard as, as the real world are not real. They're phenomena. They're, you know, they're, they're good, bad, true, false, right, wrong, big, small, and all the rest. And, you know, phenomena changes and it's, it's, uh, Qualities are dependent on other qualities. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it still goes on. The body's a phenomenon. One's own human form is a phenomenon. It's not, and but we see it in terms of, uh, habitual identity. This is me. I'm this, this physical body sitting here. When that illusion falls away, when you contemplate that, then there's, the body's still sitting here, and there's still consciousness operating. And you know, so behind all the phenomena and the, and the sankharas is consciousness. So it's, it's like, so consciousness is here and now. It's not something you get if you practice hard. You don't attain it. It's just, you know, all of you, you know, no matter what state of mind you're in at this moment, the, the consciousness is the same. You know, so consciousness is not about because I've 47 bosses that I have a higher consciousness than you do. What is that again? When I say my consciousness is higher than yours because I've lived a celibate life and and trained uh, with the uh, vinaya, so. My consciousness is much better than yours. You just come out of the business world making scams and cheating the government. (laughs) And you come here, and and I've been perfectly moral for all these years, so I'm much higher. What is that? That's... Sankara is that Sake Diti Tilabhata Bharamasa Vichikija. Those are the fetters. They're Sankaras though. They're, you know, they, it's not to dismiss them, or, but to recognize that uh, self of, a sense of a self, separate self. <clears throat> the very pronouns, I, me, mine, are, you know, are, you know, can be used in, in communication. But they are conditioned phenomena that arise and cease according to conditions. And then the Buddha's uh, pointing, because the Buddha wasn't uh, kind of in telling us what we should do or what we should believe. It's always pointing. It's like, a, you know, here, it's right here and now. It's and it's like the, even the Four Noble Truths are about here and now. Uh, he wasn't trying to trace the history of dukkha throughout modern uh, civilization and understand the dukkha of, uh, you know, previous dynasties or whatever, but pointing to dukkha as a noble truth, which is the same dukkha. It hasn't, first noble truth is still uh, accurate as as what we experience in this time. So he wasn't, you know, he wasn't saying you have to believe that there's a place called Nibbana and if you're really good you'll go there when you, you know, and uh, it wasn't a promise about, you know, 
being good and then being rewarded for it. It's about awakening in the present. And so, you know, you can, I like to uh, use the words, what, what the Dhamma, what is the teaching of the Buddha? Awake to reality. Awake to the real. And, and, or just w- awake. The word Buddha means awake. Awaken consciousness. So we're all conscious, you know, and it's not, that's not the problem, but whether we're awake or not is something now. Now if we're attached to our conditioning, our sense of ourself as a physical being, as a man or woman, as even a monk or Bhikkhu or Samanera or lay person or we're attached to any identity, we're good or bad, and it's coming out of ignorance of Dhamma. Now these are maybe good attachments. You know, at first you kind of, I'm a Bhikkhu now and it, and you feel good about it because it's a, it has a, a kind of inspired meaning and, and I choose, I chose to become a Bhikkhu. But the actual identity with the word, you see through it. If you're practicing according to, to where the Buddha is pointing. And where is the Buddha pointing? And that, is he pointing at Dukkha, the, the corruption of the government or the injustice or the, you know, if we get everything straightened out on the worldly level, get a united nations where everybody keeps the five precepts, and, and we give up all selfish intentions and work for the welfare of the whole. You know, that's, that's an inspired ideal. You know, that's a beautiful ideal, but it's not the way things are. An ideal is, is the very best that you can think. You know, if you, if you're idealistic, then you're, you're caught in thinking the, the very best kind of thoughts the highest, most inspiring, most meaningful, most profound, compassionate thoughts. That's the best in human thinking. But the Buddha wasn't pointing that we should become the best, but wake to the real life. And what is reality at this moment is that all conditions are impermanent. So it's always here and now. Whatever you know, state you're in physically, mentally, emotionally, you know, whatever you observe, uh, fear or uh, anger or jealousy or greed or whatever, it is what it is, a sankara. And our relationship to it is not to, to try to get rid of it in order to become better, but to understand it in terms of its nature of impermanence. And, and it's not, it has no kind of soul to it. When you look at any emotion you happen to feel and the strong sense of a self, when you really look at it closely, you can't find anything like any substance, permanent kind of substance in it or in, there's no heart to it. It's just, it's like described in the scriptures like soap bubbles or foam on the sea. You know, it has an appearance of being something, but when you touch it, it, it disappears in the thin air. There's nothing to it. There's no core, no soul, no self. And this... This way of investigating is, you know, it's it's uh, it's not part of Western civilization. <clears throat> you know, in Western <clears throat> culture, Western philosophy. I mean, it, it kind of you find certain Greek sages or Roman Stoics and that getting quite close to the whole thing, but they never clearly stated it as clearly as the Buddha did. And 
where in, in this simple teaching of the Four Noble Truths, the kind of the basic teaching and uh, that simple sermon that he gave, first sermon, it's all there, you know, it's, a, it's taking the ordinary, the banal, the common human experience of dukkha. And then we change towards trying to get rid of it to understanding. You see, so it's not an attainment. You don't attain understanding. You have to totally accept dukkha. You have to look at it, receive it, to really understand something. You have to accept it for what it is. You know, you can't understand anything if you're always running away from it or trying to deceive yourself about it. You know, my dukkha is because of you. You know, you, you didn't, um, you didn't respect me enough. So I suffer because you don't respect me enough. That's, that's, uh, that is the creation of my, my, my kilesa mind. But if, you know, even like in the Christian, uh, I like the Christian uh, symbol of the crucifixion, you know, where this is a most kind of horrific uh, sign, you know, that Christianity is very fond of, of uh, Jesus hanging, you know, tortured on a cross, nailed to to a cross. So everybody, you know, he's he's naked. Everybody's laughing, jeering, making fun. They put a crown of thorns on his head. And say, okay, King of the Jews, ha ha ha, and you know, you know, total humiliation, total rejection, and physical pain. Nailed to something that you can't, you know, you can't even get off it or run away. And you're stuck there on a hill. And you think of anything worse than that. <laughs> and and then, then in the Christian sense, you know, it's like, uh, you know, he, he, he's aware and he sees all these people around and, he's, and he forgives them. So he, he says, I forgive them. And then, uh, and then the, the people are saying, well, if you're the son of God, why don't you get God to come and take you off the cross? You know, your father. And just to say, okay, I've had enough, dad. Come and take me off this terrible place and save me from this humiliation. And that doesn't work. And then, of course, in the final scene, he even says the father why hast thou forsaken me and in that and then the, the surrender to the to the crucifixion itself well most of us will never be called upon to endure such misery hopefully but also it's this surrender to the cross or to the world in, not in a passive uh, negative way, but no longer resisting, trying to save yourself, get something, get sympathy, uh, be justified in, in your claims on in, in the worldly level, but it's like a relinquishing. Even God forsakes. Even, you know, everything falls away. Even your wishes, your faith, everything falls away. But you surrender to the restraint, then so like the cross can be seen like the vinya, you know. So you you like surrender to it, and don't fight it and resist it or that. But it's, the whole point is, it's a kind of uh, vehicle or form that we're we're hung on, and if we keep you know trying to get off it and trying to um, you know resist, then we, we, you know, we increase the amount of suffering. So this relinquishing or surrender or uh, letting go of our personal wishes, desires, even in the midst of pain and humiliation, rejection, desertion, disappointment, grief and sorrow, 
And that's what real practice is about in anyone's life. We have to deal with grief as a part of a human experience. And we all see our parents get old and feeble. Grandparents, parents die. Our beloved teachers, Lung Po Cha, die. And, and uh, you know, the, we, this is a part of a lifetime. And in, in grief counseling, in Europe, for example, uh, people aren't prepared for that. They, you know, even though their mother or father might be 95 years old, when they die, they think, why did they have to die? You know, I've heard this from intelligent English people. They, why, you know, 95, why did she have to die, my love, my mother? They're, you know, you think you could solve that problem yourself, you know. 95 is not exact, you're not going to get younger again. And uh, and that's pretty much, you know, when you're 95, you must be glad to die. You know, get rid of this old, worn-out corpse. But people don't reflect, you know, they want. They, they just follow and hold on to their feelings, no matter how absurd or foolish those feelings might be. Uh, they don't reflect on them, and they don't, they don't see, they don't investigate their lives. So even when the natural course of events, old age, sickness, and death happen to us, we're, how many are prepared for that? You know, we, we think it's not fair. Why should I get cancer? Uh, when, you know, I'm, you know, if I'm still young and I, have cancer, and they say, why should I, you know, I'm young, why, you know, should somebody else get cancer instead of you? <laughs> or, you know, what did I do to deserve this? But when you start putting it in the context of old age, sickness, and death, this is just putting, it, this isn't a, a negative reflection, it's just understanding that, that condition phenomena is like this. It starts out its birth, uh, you know, and then, then uh, you grow up, get old, get sick, and die, and that's just the the nature of all phenomena, whether it's mental, physical, or whatever. It's just it's, you know, it's just common sense, really, when you look at it. It's not kind of high esoteric philosophy or metaphysics. It's just pointing to the reality that we all experience. But now we're, we're relating to it in a different way than seeing it in the highly personal, judgmental terms of our own egos, our cultural expectations, or emotional habits. We're using mindfulness, sati, and apprehension, clear understanding uh, based on wisdom, not on idea on how things should be, but on the way things are. So you can always count on, no matter what, if it, if it begins, it ends, if it is born, it dies, it's, whether it's a refined mental state or, a, you know, a, a world system, a universal system. We can't wait for the end of this universal system because we haven't lived that long. We've got this lifespan, you know, at the most a hundred years, so, but you don't need to know about that, you know, about the, the whole universal system. You just learn from this, this, the breath in your own body, inhaling, exhaling, about posture, sitting, standing, walking, lying down, about sense, pleasure, pleasurable feelings, painful feelings, neutral feelings, about uh, consciousness. You can't, you can't find consciousness. You can't, you know, it's not an object that you can find, but you can recognize, because you're, you're experiencing it yourself. Consciousness is like this. And what do you mean like this? This is, is a kind of, this is it, consciousness. Or say, compared to space, you say, Space, 
Would you define space for me, Ajahn Sumedho? You can't define space. It's here and now. You know, just look. Right, all around us. How do you define it? And they may most likely spacious <laughs> or whatever, if, you know, if you're desperate. But space doesn't have any quality, does it? It's not red or blue. It's not beautiful or ugly. It's spacious. And it has no boundary. Well, you know, where does the space end? Just on a visual level, you know. And, you know, you say, well, the wall. No, the walls are in the space. You know, it keeps carrying it out. There's no, there's no boundary to it. Space and consciousness. Elements. The two elements that support earth, fire, water, and air. The, the, the condition phenomena, the energies that create forms that are born and die. So in this, in the, in the Buddhist teaching, it's teaching there's earth, fire, water, air, space, and consciousness. Consciousness is is a uh, you know in the West in Western psychology and science there is a people are terribly interested in consciousness you know because the West has never really understood it you know so it it uh, you know the, I remember you know some famous psychologist years ago was saying that uh, dogs aren't conscious. Uh, Dogs aren't conscious. <laughs> what are they then? You know, they certainly look conscious to me, unless they're dead. The corpse of a dog. But, but consciousness can be just seen as ability to think. You know, they don't. We th- we believe dogs don't think. Uh, and then you you know then the uh, Native Americans. But see, everything is consciousness, like the trees and the rocks. I mean, that's a, you know, they're primitive Indians, you know. They don't know anything. They're not civilized like we are, uh, where we, we, we see trees as just, you know, objects that we can use. But they, they don't have any consciousness. But when, you know, whether a tree's consciousness or not, you know, I, I don't have any insight into communicating through consciousness with trees, but uh, why not? They're a form in space, aren't they? They're in a conscious realm. They, they have form. And that's all you need, form uh, that is born. Then it's a conscious form. It, has, it grows, it survives according to its shape, its form, its species, uh, and, and it's uh, karma the way it is. But getting back to the direction the Buddha was pointing to, uh, I've told this story many times uh, about when Lung Po Cha took me and Tenjo Kun Amon on a trip after I think I was about my third pansa with Lung Po Cha and he took us to meet the Kuba Ajans in northeast so we went to see Lung Pu Fan in Sukhumakorn and, and Lung Tabua Ajan Mahabua he wasn't called Lung Tabua then Ajan Mahabua and then uh, Lung Pu Kao was a, another famous Tommy Yu, Ajahn, disciple of uh, Ajahn Man. And so Lung Po Cha was, uh, he'd been given a Philips tape recorder at that time. And it wasn't, they didn't have cassettes then, so they had these t- uh, what do you call them? Yeah. I forget. Reels, reels. And so and anyway, Ajahn Chah liked gadgets very much. And so he was uh, recording, you know, he'd get Lumpu Fan to give a desana. 
and then he'd record it up tape why then then he would go to Ajahn Mahabua uh, Ajahn Ban Wat Doi and and then when Lung Pu Kao Wat Tam Klong Pen in Udon and I, I you know I wasn't very they spoke you know, everybody speak spoke, speaking in Ethan dialect and and I couldn't really understand very much so I just sat there and and then when we went to see Lung Pu Kao he's uh, they taped him, and then it was time to go. Lung Pu Kao was in a wheelchair, you know, so, uh, and I was sitting quite a distance from him, and then, uh, Ajahn Maha Mon Lung Pu Chao got up and left, and I was about ready to get up, and then Lung Pu Kao beckons to me, he said, Mani, Mani, I could understand enough to get, Mani means come here, and he, he, he gave this motion. So I went close to the the Lumpu Kao in wheelchair and he and then he pointed, he said, to his chest, you know, here to his heart, he said, Kwam Jing Yuti Ni, Kwam Jing Yuti Ni, Kwam Jing Yuti Ni, three times. Means the reality is here. Now, you know, I knew he wasn't pointing to himself as a personality. That's the pointing, the direction. You know, so when you're looking for Dhamma, you, you, it's here. It's not something out there. You know, you, you try to find it in India under the Bodhi tree at Burgaya or wherever, or the different Kuba Ajans, but Lumpukha, the the truth, reality is here. And this is the direction to, to observe, you know, what mindfulness is. It's not, you know, you can be mindful when you're driving a car. You can't be looking at your, your, your uh, Ramana, particularly, you've got to be aware on a visual level of uh, stoplights and people crossing the street. So there's that kind of mindfulness, uh, just uh, survival, you know, and protection. But mindfulness then expanded to the mind itself. Rather than trying to figure out what other people think or feel or experience, or read about great arahants and how they realize Dhamma, you start looking here, observing. But not with the critical faculty. It's not about uh, good, bad, or me or mine. It's just awakening to the reality of here and now. And then we have what we call a Ramana. We have a mental quality that we begin to notice like doubt or fear or anger, lust, jealousy, anxiety, worry, confusion, <clears throat> feeling sleepy, uh, feel depressed, or whatever. It can be, you know, feeling elated, feeling at the top or at the bottom. But the knowing of that feeling is like, in, in, uh, the Satipatthana, Jitanu Pasana, where you're actually looking, observing, uh, your mental state. And then, then, you know, when we usually, you know, uh, if they're very kind of not very interesting mental states, you know, then we, if we're worried, we try to find security. We don't like worry. If we're worriers, uh, you know, then we suffer a lot because we can sit here and worry about the future. And, and anything in the future is possible to imagine everything to worry about. Getting old, losing your teeth, losing your hair, getting cancer, whatever. It's a, whatever you imagine possible also, you may be more on a positive level in the future. I'm going to succeed. I'm going to really penetrate the truth and become an arhat. And I'm going to really practice hard in order to, in the future to become, uh, you know, the first American arhat. And then I can really teach. You know, I can go back to the States and I'm going to give those Americans the real stuff, you know, modern 
Dhamma according to the great Arahant Ajahn Sumato. That, that's possibility. <laughs> In the future, but what is it here and now? You know, so I look at the Aramana here and now. And then because I've been practicing like this for so long, then aware that, that I'm very, I, I recognize pure consciousness is the reality of this moment. It's not, it's not I create it, it's just recognize, realize. It's real. It's not a conditioned state that I create by controlling the environment. It's it's the ultimate reality behind everything, behind the body, the breath, the the mood, uh, the mental habits, the fears, and and that that can arise in consciousness. Now the Buddha made this very clear. You know, like mind states and the word mind, English word. Uh, usually refer, refers to sankharas like mental states. It's like sanya sankara. Uh, these these things change, and uh, their nature is arising, ceasing. And as you look in the direction, look at your own mind, mental states, not with a personal view that they're really yours or they, they are what they are. So whatever you're, you're feeling, uh, experiencing, uh, that which is aware of the mood, the mind, the emotion, the quality that you recognize here is, it's pure consciousness operating, observing. It's not, pure consciousness isn't critical. Is not is not making any comment about even if you're you know thinking terrible thoughts. It's not that you shouldn't be thinking these terrible thoughts. It's recognizing that the terrible thoughts are they're not really terrible. You create that sense of they're terrible and they're yours, but they they are what they are. They have arisen or like this and they cease. If you're patient and let things just you know, cease according to their nature, then you you recognize pure consciousness that is always operative no matter what state of mind you're in in the present moment. So you don't attain it. There's nothing you get. It's just suddenly wake up to it. This is it. Nothing more than that. And it's through non-attachment because attachment out of ignorance always blinds us to that, to that, to this reality. We can, whatever we're attached to, then we, we interpret all our experience, uh, in a, this, this, through this distortion of a condition. And, and so our lives, we've seen everything through, through distorted perceptions of reality. <clears throat> then we, then that's why we suffer, because we aren't seeing reality. We're we're always operating through various distortions of it and and misinterpreting it. So then, this the cause of suffering is ignorance of this of of ultimate reality and and operating always from the conditioning, like the ego, the sense of yourself as a person as as a physical body uh, in whatever way, those are conventions. They can, there's not, nothing wrong with them, but their limitation is that if we don't awaken to them in their true nature as all conditions are impermanent, then we're always experiencing life through distorted perceptions. And that always results in suffering. You know, in some form of anguish or despair or disappointment or worry, doubt, depression, all operate from that. You know, the results of that attachment.
So after Limpu Kao's profound desana to me, you know, it didn't take much in the Thai language. I could understand the, the language that much. But I've never forgotten it, you know, because it came from uh, a monk I greatly admired, who was highly, who was highly regarded in Thailand. But also, he wasn't pointing at himself. He said, I'm a, you know, I'm enlightened arahant. Uh, you look at me and you'll be okay. He was pointing, you know, in the direction of jitta. Uh, and in Thai they say, do jit. Hen, hen jit, ru, ru jit. And they use the word jitta for, for the consciousness, pure consciousness. And that which is aware, then that itself is conscious. You know, it's, it's pure consciousness operating, observing conditioned phenomena. So that is, means that pure consciousness is never, you know, if, if we don't attach to the conditions, then pure consciousness is always pure. It's not never going to be soiled, no matter what terrible conditions you might find in yourself. And that's important to reflect, that your true nature is pure. <clears throat> it's real. It's, you know, it's not a, you know, the idea of becoming uh, enlightened and then uh, nirvana is extinction. Uh, and that that's usually quite depressing for most Western people because it means like annihilation. You think, well, I'm practicing all these 47 years to um, make myself extinct, to annihilate myself. Why, why didn't you just cut your throat in the beginning and get it over with? <laughs> and, uh, it would have been a lot easier. And I have thought of it at times. <laughs> but the, uh, that's not it. It's not about, because extinction is a thought, isn't it? It's a, it's a concept that we create. And it, and so it, 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 it's not about annihilating. But you can't conceive the inconceivable. You can't conceive, when you try to define consciousness, it's beyond definition. You know, it's not about defining. You define conditions. You can define conditions. This is big, this is small, this is mine, that's yours. This is this is a good condition. This is a bad condition, and you can you can give them qualities and and values and according to uh, your own conditioning. But consciousness, you can't say it's good or bad, but it's recognizable. So that that's like mindfulness is the only way that a human individual can get that perspective. There's no other way to do it. Because, uh, you know, we're, we're stuck for a lifetime in these forms, uh, vulnerable condition phenomenon, these human forms, with their incredible sensitivity in a realm that's all about sensitivity, impingement, feeling, pleasure, pain, heat and cold. It's all, you know, powerful realm we're experiencing. Uh, in this form, it's, it's, uh, relentless. Just from birth to death, we're always being, in some way, you know, always impinged on, irritated by the conditions around us. And that's, this realm is like that. It's the realm of suffering. It's unsatisfactory. There's no point in trying to find satisfaction in it. Because uh, it, it, this is not where it's at. Satisfaction comes through awakening to it. And this was the whole point of the Buddha's teaching. Because he pointed this out very clearly. And, and in this first sermon, it's all there. You know, it's not like it, it's beginner's Buddhism and then you advance to, to a much more profound, esoteric, higher form of Buddhist uh, teaching, if you really trust in just 
using this first sermon, Arya Satsi, the Four Noble Truths, then this is enough. But you have to, you know, it's easy enough to memorize Four Noble Truths. It doesn't take much time to do that. But the Bhati Bhata sign, every Noble Truth has, you know, it has its, its statement, its Bariati statement, there is suffering. And that's a, that's a statement from the scripture. There is suffering. That's Bariati Dhamma. Bhati Bhat Dhamma is, what do you do about it? You know, so there is suffering. So what? Understand it. So the practice then is to understand dukkha and through understanding, through turning, recognizing, investigating dukkha, then there's the insight, but the wait. But the wait dhamma, the insight that suffering has been realized, been recognized, understood. Suffering has been, uh, has been understood. So these three aspects to each noble truth is, uh, you know, it tells you what to do. It gives you the variety teaching, what to do about it, and the result of having done that. So you've got variety, bhati bhati, bhati weti. There's a bhati bhati bhati. Rupa Cha was always talking about bhati bhat or practice, bhati bhata, because so much of Buddhism in Thailand is bariati dhamma, you know, studying the scriptures from the, from the Tripitaka. And so his emphasis was on bhati bhat, practice. Then the bhati bhat, through right practice, then there's the insight. And you know for sure, it's a, it's a knowledge that isn't based on believing the bariati, but in proving it. So you're not going around trying to just quote what the Buddha said in the scripture anymore, but you know. You know, it's a profound knowing of reality as you've awakened to reality. And that's quite amazing that as a human being we can do this. I'm, you know, at my age I'm so impressed by the fact that it's actually possible to do this. Because uh, before I started practicing, you know, I was quite, you know, I just felt life was, uh, was pointless. You know, and according to the way I saw myself and the world around me, I, I couldn't see any purpose to being human. <clears throat> and then being brought up as a Christian, my mother said, well, you're born because God loves you and, and you should love him. But I didn't feel that. You know, I didn't care whether God loved me or not. I just thought, this is a joke, you know, being born in, in this form and having to endure a lifetime, finding food, urinating, defecating, sexual desire leads you all over the place. And, and then what if you, what is the purpose of it? Is it, are we just here to procreate more human beings? Is that, all we're here for, just like the animal kingdom, and uh, or just to eat, sleep, and procreate, is that? Or because God loves us? Well, why did? He, why does He need? And He wants me to love Him. Why? Why? What does He care about whether I love Him or not? You know, the mind of a of a doubter. And then encountering the Buddha's teaching, you know, suddenly taking something that I could easily recognize in myself, dukkha, suffering, I could relate to that because I was, uh, you know, in a state of cynical despair. Uh, not because life had treated me badly, but because I couldn't see any point to it. And, and I didn't, I had no worldly ambitions. You know, I didn't have an ambitious mind to become president of the United States. Or <laughs> and uh, I didn't have any goals, you know, worldly goals that attracted me. <clears throat> so that, 
I thought that was like I'm a depressed, neurotic case. Because being American, you're supposed to love life, and life is beautiful, and you just enjoy, enjoy, and become rich, and get everything you want, and improve your personality, and be, you know, it's all so positive. My generation was incredibly positive about life. And, uh, and yet I couldn't really believe that either. So you become cynical. You think it's all rubbish and doesn't mean anything. But the one, the one thing that really aroused interest was the Buddhist teaching. That was the only light I saw at the end of the darkness was the Buddha light. So then uh, coming to Thailand and having opportunities like this to, to ordain practice, to actually make it work, you know, put it, you know, because I, I'm not, you know, I was still doubting enough maybe it didn't work. Maybe it's just another religious philosophy that's passed its sell-by date. Maybe it's just ceremonies and and then nothing more to it than that. But I, I kind of intuitively recognize that, that underlying the external uh, side of the Buddhist world, there was this profound teaching of based on suffering, the causes, the, the extinction of suffering and the awakening to reality, the fourth noble truth. And then, of course, self-doubt. Maybe I can't do it. You know, I never had a, a high regard for myself. I never could have considered myself, uh, you know, God's gift to mankind or that I was, you know, in any way a uh, highly gifted individual that would, you know, really be able to do it. I, maybe I can't do it. You know, maybe it's just beyond me. But in, the, in Thailand here where... Where, with somebody like Lung Po Cha, based on Dukkha, it wasn't about, you know, being a highly gifted individual, but about awakening to suffering. I was certainly aware of suffering. And then to Bhati Bhata, to practice understanding, which means I had to really accept suffering and do Kind of embrace it, let it, whatever I'm suffering, you know, my own anguish or despair now is like this. So changing from just how do I get rid of these negative mind states to being, allowing them to be what they are. But the change in, in, uh, this, this tradition, the Ajahn Man kind of Thai force tradition, they, they use this uh, mantra, Puto, which is a, uh, Buddha's name and the kind of mantra and uh, and it means you know they translated it Puru which is like like knowing because you like somebody's asking me the, today about the you know the ego if there's no ego then what is it that knows things you know if you if you don't have an ego there's there's a, still a subjective reality operating even uh, you know, when you know, there's no ego, and then you want to you want to give it a name. It's like, is that my soul, or is that you know you think of is that my true nature, my soul, or whatever you want to to define it in some way, and then uh, and then in this Thai tradition or in the Theravada tradition, they. Buddha Dhamma Sangha, Bhutto is, is the knowing in the present. It's pure conscious knowing with, and wisdom operates in pure consciousness. And so all we, the, the, developing the path is by awakening to that, beginning to recognize and value this, 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 even if it's just a flash or a moment of pure conscious awareness is like this. And because it is, 
you know, you on your ego will still deny it or say, you know, it's nothing pure about this moment. But don't believe it. Don't believe what your mind says because it lies, it deceives, it deludes you. But learning to trust in Buddha Dhamma Sangha means in awareness, mindfulness, awaken to reality here and now. <clears throat> and then just through these these momentary uh, insights, more and more as you trust it and cultivate it, then you, you know, it connects because you're actually learning to let go of birth and death, of sankharas. Not through annihilating or denying them, but through not being attached to them anymore. And so then you're, you can abide in this reality of knowing within this limited form uh, and, and the experiences that it has to have till it dies. So I offer this as an encouragement to, um, you know, to, to uh, be awakened it's not, you know, it's not something, I'm not suggesting that no one can do this, except, you know, you have to be a highly evolved meditator like me. You know, you start from where you're at, and whatever coarse defilements and madness you're experiencing in the present, is still being aware of it is, is the path, that's where that's what the Buddha is pointing to. Here and now, ultimate reality. Awake, awake to the real. Awakening to reality. So I offer this for your reflection. Thank you. <laughs>